Uh, this is the computer that, uh, this is the Apple II that you, you brought to the, well, this you bought is on eBay? Apple II. They've, yeah, I, I didn't bring the Apple II. Okay. I think I donated the Apple One. Okay, so this is the looks Apple. Like, looks like my hand built case. It might even have been my own, but I think I bought it on eBay. It's missing a part, though. Which, which part is missing? Oh, one little power regulator okay. part that you could, you could easily buy online. So this is the original. This is what this is what started everything. Yeah, that's what started everything. And two rows of chips down here in the lower right corner are RAMs. Okay. If you subtract the RAMs, you'll just see all these other chips are mostly one dollar chips and a microprocessor. They're very inexpensive, and so the whole formula is, you know, for that's so obvious. My gosh, that could be a whole computer that can run basic. Run basic's the key. You have to have enough memory to run basic and still be affordable. And you also need affordable input and output. Works with your home TV. <laughs> Everybody had a home TV, so that's free. And and so that was really the, the, the first formula. And, and, and what was the, the minimum amount of RAM required to run basic back then? 4K bytes had been through all time. I had decided when I was in high school, I told my dad I was going to own a, uh, one of these other exhibits, there's a data general Nova computer, I was going to own a 4K Nova. The reason for 4K, it's the minimum you needed to write, type in programs in a programming language and have them run and do what you wanted. Why a programming language? I mean, you can always program in what's called machine, computer language. Sure, or But somewhat. these programming languages are what all the books are written of. You can buy books that have games, things that other people have done. It's a much easier way to enter programs. It's what um, one of the women that was introduced this morning, Fran Allen, worked as a developing compilers. Compilers allow you to type in more of a human language and get it translated to the ones and zeros computers understand. So I wanted to run that kind of a language. And I had never programmed in BASIC. There were other computer languages. But after Bill Gates wrote his BASIC, and I heard of a book called 101 Games in BASIC, I knew that I had to do BASIC. I had to learn it and write it. Okay. And up to that point, had you programmed in, in Assembler or? Um, well, other? I had programmed in many languages in my life. For scientific, scientific people like myself had used Fortran, mm -hmm. Algol, PL1. There were a few other languages around. But I had skipped basic, I just missed it because our school never had computers. In the, or in the days when I was in school, schools could rent these terminals. And the kids could come in and type in programs on a terminal, which was connected to what's called time sharing, over the modems to some big computer somewhere. And they all shared. So a lot of computers, a lot of kids got some basic experience. That's why there existed game books like 101 Computer Games in Basic. But I realized you've got to have the game to these early computers in the home, you got to have that game attachment. So it had language had to be basic, even though I'd never used it. I had to learn it, and then start writing out the plan of how to write a language. How do you write the ones and zeros that allow a person to type in human things? That I'd never been trained in either. So I had to, um, but I was a good thinker. Well, obviously, I did um. it all. You know what? <laughs> when you have to do it to get to your goal, which is to have your own programmable computer. You have to write a programming language. You, I mean, you won't have it. You won't have it without it. And that forces you to do things whether you know how to do them or not. You, know, you do them. One thing that, that strikes me is that today there's such a hard distinction between the hardware and the software side. Uh, people who are involved in, in software don't touch the hardware, and, and yeah. the converse is true. But you did it all. You did you know, both yeah. the hardware design and, and the software. Yeah, even when I developed these early Apple computers, it was also very much you were a software person or a hardware person. And people would often come in and ask, well, what, who did the hardware? You know, I did the hardware. And then they'd say, oh, Steve Jobs did the software. And I did it all. Um, it was a rare point in history, too, where one good computer could be actually completely built and designed by one person. You didn't have, nowadays, the, the computers are so valuable money-wise, you have to have teams of hundreds of people working on every little detail, and there's millions of lines of code, more than any one person could ever do. And before the Apples, Computers were so huge, you had to have big teams working on hardware and software. Yeah, they, they always partitioned things out. You know, you can read the book Soul of a New Machine. A lot of different engineers worked on different parts of it, but I got to do the whole thing myself. That was the rare, that was one of the rarest things ever. How much do you think the fact that, that you did everything yourself and, and you did both the hardware and the software, how much of that do you think that contributed to the actual success of, of Apple? 
uh, I think hugely. It made me incredibly intimately connected to how everything worked with everything, every piece of the machine, and what, how to expand it, how to add this on, how to, how to organize it in a logical organization. All was in my head, so it was all right, unless I died or something. It was like it didn't come from multiple minds with things that didn't match and line up and you had to modify things later to make A talk to B. No, it was um, really good. But the, the Apple One wasn't exactly a computer design like the Apple II was. That was really designed to be a computer from day one. Apple One was modifying an earlier project I built into a computer. Okay, can we talk a little bit about the differences between the Apple One and the Apple II? Sure. Okay. The Apple II typed black and white text only, at a slow speed on a monitor, 60 characters per second. That's like a row and a half of characters per second going slowly. Why? Because it was modified from a, a terminal I had built that had to talk over the internet. I'm not, no, the ARPANET, over a modem, and over modems you could only type 30 characters per second anyway. Television, United States televisions, refresh the screen 60 times a second and I used that as an advantage to how I would update characters and got in 60 characters a second based on... See, I, so I look at the environment you're in, the chips that are available, and then I design my computer based on them rather than conceiving a computer and figuring out what parts to use. So I, I do things so optimally. I used a certain kind of memory for the television screen that was the absolute cheapest way to do it that allowed you to have 60 characters a second. Now, when you want to build a real computer for people, microprocessor can get in there and change, you know, a thousand, thousands of characters a second, tens of thousands. So it's way too slow. You have to go back and redesign it from the ground up around the new approach. And that was the Apple II. The Apple II, one of the clever things I thought of was, why store the computer screen in a bunch of its own memory and the computer has its memory? and then it can talk a character at a time into the, the, the television memory. I said, why don't you just make one set of memory and have the circuitry that reads the same memory that the microprocessor can get in and out of, the television gets out of to grab its data for visual. Then you type a number into memory and a, a character A appears on a screen. You type another number into memory and a blue square pops up on the screen. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, the screen is totally controllable by the software. Excellent. That was the Apple II. That was the Apple II. Yeah. Okay.